Hi everyone and welcome to the first ever virtual property show. My name is Bruno Simao, Specialist Property Attorney at Bruno Simao Attorneys and Intergen Wealth. This is my business partner, partner Shili Boy Motiba. Hi everyone, my name is Shili Boy as Bruno introduced me. I'm Executive and Co-Founder of Intergen. I specialize in property tax at Intergen. So thank you for joining us today. Um, the, the point of today's conversation is to discuss a very important principle that sometimes people don't think about when uh, deciding to create wealth. Now, wealth creation is something that a lot of us are interested in, and there's a lot of companies out there, like the Property Academy, for example, that focuses on giving you the tools to create the wealth that you need for retirement or to pass on a legacy to your family. But a very important principle, and sometimes where money slips through the cracks, is your wealth preservation. Because this is where you try and retain that wealth for as long as possible so that you make the best use out of it. You pay as little tax as possible, you make sure that your assets are protected, um, and you make sure that you structure it in a way that works for you. So with this in mind, what we try and do is we try and look at the legal principles and apply them to how these investment structures work. Now, one of the biggest, one of the biggest problems that I tend to find is people do te tend to complain about the way that our law is structured, uh, the protections, the fa uh, how, how it favors, for example, SARS and the taxes that you pay. What you need to understand is these laws exist. And if you want to be a smart and savvy property investor, it's not about fighting the laws, it's about working with them to make sure that your property journey is made as easy and as optimized as possible. So the first thing that we, uh, that we start looking at is I don't jump in and, and start trying to explain the different vehicles to you because you need to understand why these vehicles are in place before you actually decide on the vehicle that you're going to use. So you'll see from the slide over here that we make mention of three principles. It's asset protection, tax efficiency, and financing optimization. Now these are the principles, the core values, and the core principles that we use when trying to structure a person's, a person's um, investment structure or property investment structure. The reason why we focus on these is there has to be a balance between them, because if you lack that balance between these three core principles, um, you will unfortunately be hampered or hindered somewhere along your property journey. So just to give you a brief explanation or definition of these three principles, when we speak about asset protection, we're speaking about being able to isolate your assets, uh, from, isolate them and ring fence them from exposure. So uh, situations like this, for example, is when we suggest that you don't, keep, um, you don't keep assets in your own personal name, and we'll explain why in, in a short while. You try and move them into companies or vehicles that don't carry as much exposure so that if for some reason something goes wrong and creditors start trying to, to attach some of your assets, you've at least separated them and ring fenced them to keep them safe. Tax efficiency, Shilly Boy will go through in quite, in quite some detail a little bit later on, uh, where we start looking at short-term tax planning, long-term tax planning, what the implications are, what the benefits are, and again, how you can find that perfect balance to suit your own needs. Uh, lastly, we look at financing optimization. Financing optimization, financing optimization um, deals with the ability of using these investment structures to be able to um, get as much external financing from banks, for example, other property investors, you name it. Um, and we'll also quickly touch on how best to do this so that you can uh, obviously get that external money so you can build your portfolio as quickly as possible. Now, with that being said, um, now the discussion of the vehicles becomes important because this discussion is where we learn what vehicles exist, why they exist, and how we can actually use them to benefit us in our, pro in our investment journey. So as, as most of you know, um, a lot of people, and we meet a lot of people that have bought properties in their own personal names. Um, by buying a property in your own personal name, there are a lot of downsides to this. So I'll give you a quick example. Um, a, a person that buys a property in their own personal name, but for example, also runs a business in their own personal name, has now effectively exposed the business to the property investment and the property investment to the business. So it's things like this that you, you want to try and avoid. So our general suggestion is that you try and place as little as possible 
uh, in your own personal name and actually try and move it to one of the other vehicles that we have here, either a trust or a company. By moving these and isolating them and ring fencing them, you've at least got a level of asset protection behind this. Also remember, and Shilibu will touch on this, um, your, you as a natural person have unfortunately a limited lifespan. And because of this limited lifespan, it means when you pass away, a number of things need to happen. And generally, it means that you need to move these assets from your name into the name of your children or your spouse or your parents, whatever the case may be. And because of this, there's certain costs associated with that. So this is also something that you want to try and avoid and where the tax, long term tax efficiency planning comes in. Um, all in all, buying your own personal name sometimes has benefits. But for the most part, the, 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 the downsides or the trade-offs, uh, the negative trade-offs outweigh these. Um, a trust and a company, uh, we normally use combinations of these in order to try optimize the, the, the investment structure. Uh, what people normally don't understand is they ask us the question, what, should we buy in a trust or should we buy in a company? It's not a question of which one you should buy in as much as it is why are you buying in these. So a trust, as far as we're concerned, is always the fundamental structure that we use. Why is that? Because a trust offers a level of asset protection that a company generally doesn't. Uh, remember, as a company shareholder, the shares still form a part of your estate. So even though you own the company and the company has ring-fenced that property within its name, the problem is those shares haven't been ring-fenced because you're owner of those shares. And that's why we use trusts. We either use trusts to own the properties directly, there's some benefits to that, um, and there are some benefits for the trust to actually own the shares in the companies and let the companies trade and the trust sit and, uh, as a holding structure effectively, holding these shares and not necessarily overly trading in its own name. So a trust offers this protection mainly because uh, the way that a trust holds assets, it doesn't belong to the beneficiaries. The beneficiaries don't necessarily have a vested right in those, in, in those, be, in those benefits until the trustees say so. So those assets remain safe unless, of course, the trust in its own name has debt and exposes those assets, uh, which is, again, from a structuring perspective, strategically is something that we tend to try and avoid. And this is where professional advice comes in to try and assist. Uh, also remember, trust in a company for the most part, um, or well, not for the most part, a trust in a company has a, a, a continues in perpetuity, meaning that it never dissolves unless the shareholders decide to dissolve it. So the benefit to this is whereas as a natural person you pass away and have to move the assets onto somebody else, a trust in a company doesn't have to do that because you simply replace the shareholders or you replace the beneficiaries with new beneficiaries. And by doing that, you get into a situation where um, you never have to pay those costs when you pass away, it just continues. Uh, and your children benefit, your wife benefits, your parents benefit, whoever you need to benefit, you structure it properly within this investment structure of yours. All right. So now to look, in, uh, look at this in some detail. So we discussed asset protection and we briefly defined it. So what would it look like if a person dedicates, uh, dedicates their energy solely to asset protection and nothing else? So I created this little matrix at the bottom, um, basically try, uh, explaining to you that if a person dedicates a little too much to asset protection, your structure would look very similar to one property per structure. So for example, you've got a company and one company has one property and you keep repeating this cycle over and over and over. But you'll see that if you opt to do something like that, you start losing a lot of the benefits from the, the financing optimization. Reason being, for example, that when a bank does the assessment on the company and starts looking at the company as a business, as an operating business, and it realizes that the, in, all these specific companies are individual and it looks at one of them and realizes there is no, uh, there is no income. Uh, it isn't an actual fully fledged functioning business. And because of this, it, uh, your financing optimization, your financing efficiency tends to uh, disappear. So again, that's why it's so important to reach the perfect balance between the three because unless uh, unless you're doing this intentionally because you're not looking for external funding and you're actually looking only at protecting your own money and using your own money for investments, you need to lay off a little bit on the asset protection just to offer a little bit more room uh, when it comes to, to financing efficiency. And the way that you do this, for example, is finding the balance. What a lot of my clients uh, suggest is pool certain assets together in one company, let them run as a functioning business so that the banks will see this and appreciate this, uh, but 
Um, don't, don't group higher risk assets with, with lower risk assets because you obviously still need that level of asset protection. So there are smarter ways of structuring this to suit your own benefits. And so if we just go through a couple of examples, um, we look at situations like divorces, for instance, car accidents, a range of things that happen in your personal life that you can't really mitigate all that much because you can't do it through, um, through a company, through some sort of entity. Now, what, what everyone needs to remember is a company, for example, is its own juristic person. What this basically means is if a company incurs a debt, it does so in its own name. And the shareholders and directors of the company won't be liable for this debt. Um, however, like you'll see from the financing efficiency, the banks normally when buying property will expect you to sign a, a surety ship agreement uh, that will bind you personally to the debt of the company. But short of that, for the most part, if, for example, you hire contractors to do building work, uh, you enter into any other sort of debt short of getting a loan from a bank, generally that debt will sit fixed in the books of the company and not in your own personal name. Now, that's the benefit. When it comes now, unfortunately, to your own personal name, it doesn't work like that. And the problem there is that, at least with a company, you can isolate this and keep it away from the debts in your own personal name. And again, that's what we meant by asset protection. Another thing to consider is exactly what we said regarding the mit uh, mitigation of risk. Um, you don't want to ignore asset protection altogether, put everything in one company, because that'll open you up. So, uh, you know, the old saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket, really plays true to this. The next, the next thing we're going to look at is the tax efficiency part of it. Uh, here's where Shilly Boy will jump in and just take you through it. Thank you, thank you, Bruno. Okay, Bruno touched on the asset protection, how important it is, and he also mentioned the issue of uh, financing efficiency and tax efficiency. So it's always an objective to a large extent of a property investor to pay as little tax as possible. But then with that in mind, you also want to make sure that you don't compromise the other th uh, the other two principles where in such a way that you become more aggressive tax planner and then you end up compromising access to bank financing because if you do that you might not actually be attractive to banks and in such a way that you compromise the growth of your property portfolio you also want to make sure that you balance the, your three vehicle investment vehicles, which is the trust and the, the company and you on your personal capacity. Because if from a tax point of view, individual has some of the tax benefits being rebates and, and some of the uh, exemptions that are normally applicable to a natural person. So we always try to strike that balance in such a way that we combine all those three investment vehicles together with these three principles to ensure that we reach some sort of a level of equilibrium, even though it's always a bit of a challenge. Mm. But we need to ensure that we reach that kind of, mm. uh, um, uh, what do you call, an equilibrium. Mm. So I'm going to explain some of the short-term and long-term and, and medium-term uh, objectives uh, when you come into uh, tax planning. Mm. Do you want to... Um, what's a very interesting point that we discussed earlier today oh. is the impact that we tend to find with people that aggressively go into tax, uh, tax efficiency from the, uh, the reason why your financing optimization gets reduced is because now as you're running a business, there's an expectation that there's income. If there's mm -hmm. income, there's an expectation that tax be paid on this income. Yes. If you're overly aggressive, which is exactly what he said, you try to put this income or, or move this income or capture this income in such a way that you pay the least amount of tax. But then when a bank looks at it, they'll be able to identify that and realize that there isn't enough income to actually make this a fully fledged business. Why would they want to give you a loan uh, in the company name if, if they feel that the company doesn't make enough income to be able to justify that loan? Yes, which that brings us to how do you then in a short term do a tax planning and one of the principles that is commonly used is a conjugate principle. A conjugate principle is a common law that has been adopted or codified in an income tax act. And that normally it's, it's, it tries to create a relationship between a trust and natural person. In a simple layman term says, if a trust were to receive, for example, rental income in, in a tax year, and then get distributed to beneficial, which in most cases is the natural person, then it means the trust is acting as a conduit. Then it's, also, it's going to be a natural person that get taxed in that particular year. So it can benefit you in a case where you find that a natural person is actually at the lower tax rate as compared to 
a trust because we know that the trust have a flat tax rate of about 45 percent well natural percent is between 18 and 45 percent so in cases where you find someone is sitting at 18 percent then it might be beneficial actually to distribute that rental income into the hands of um, a natural person but now the question is from asset protection where bruno was uh, mentioned earlier we don't want to we don't want to make sure that you have so much wealth in your personal capacity. So we always use some of the rebates that a natural person has a privilege for to then move that money back into the trust uh, uh, kit. Th things like uh, 100,000 donation per, per, um, per year, you can actually utilize that to return the money and capitalize your trust as a result of that. So those are some of the short-term tax planning that you can think of. You can think of things like uh, uh, getting a salary out of the company and reducing some of those um, uh, taxable income at the company level. Sometimes also instead of, if you are a natural person, you're already sitting at the max tax, uh, tax rate, tax brackets like 45%. In that case, you might want to consider retaining money or that rental income at the company level because between a company and your trust and you sitting at 45%, the best place to now retain that money is at the company level at 28%. Then instead of declaring dividends, then you've got a compound in, in investment in a, at the company level because you'll be taxed at 28% and then the remaining taxable income just shoots up and you reinvest into the, mm. the company. In that way, you're creating wealth and you're also creating wealth outside of, um, uh, outside of your personal name, which is gives you a protection for asset protection also it gives you a long-term tax planning because from estate uh, estate planning point of view you don't want to have a lot of wealth in your personal name do you want to touch on something on the short term no, no, tax no, planning no. okay so from from long-term tax planning point of view there's a biggest issue of estate duty now as estate duty is a tax that you pay on estate dutable amount so as the dutable amount is basically a value of your estate at the date of death, right? So, and then minus some of the deductions that you might get under Estate Duty Act. Things like um, bequeathed to a surviving spouse, uh, public benefit organizations that have been approved, those will be allowed to be deducted against the value of your estate at the date of your death. So meaning that if, for instance, you've got a value of about 10, um, 10 million rand of your estate duty. You will be taxed, let's assume that you already minused uh, some of the allowed deductions from that 10 million, meaning that you've got an estate duty at about 20% that needs to be paid because between 3.5, at the current uh, estate duty act, between 3.5, which is the rebate that you are allowed to deduct against your, to your gross uh, estate value, so between 3.5 and about 30 million, you are taxed at 20%. Above 30 million, you are taxed at 25%. That's quite a huge amount of money to give away if you don't do your proper tax planning. So now, on, on this example that I mentioned earlier, let's say, for instance, you've got a 10 million of your dutable, estate, uh, dutable amount that is going to be taxed at the date of your death, right? So you've got that that you're going to pay... Um, 20% of estate duty, mm. you've got capital gain tax that you're going to uh, pay because mm. when you die, under I Income Tax Act, it's deemed that you sold your assets. So it triggers the capital gain tax. Mm. So meaning that you've effectively, if let's say at the date of your death, you're sitting at the high tax brackets of about 45% and times inclusion rate of an individual of about 40%, that's effective. Uh, tax rate of about 18%. Add that to 20% of estate duty. Mm -hmm. You've got things like uh, transfer fees from legal. Bruno will be happy to charge you the con convincing fees. So you, for moving the properties from your personal name to the beneficiaries, that's money. You also have issues of um, agent fees that uh, you might have put up your property mm -hmm. on the market. Then, and on top of that, there are those um, costs that comes as a result of mm -hmm. selling under under distressed uh, position because there's a time frame that SAR says within a specific time frame an institute needs to be paid by executor over to SARS. So you will be forced sort of under pressure. Your family will be or an executor 
will be in, under pressure to actually dis or to, and to unwind your disease estate within a particular mm -hmm. and that might actually uh, sort of uh, remove some of the value from your, mm -hmm. your wealth. Absolutely. And then there's just so much expenses, things like transfer duty. Mm -hmm. Some of the properties, though there's exemption of um, a transfer duty, it, for instance, if the, the property is being transferred to your wife or the heirs or liquidity, but then at the end of the day, some of the properties might be transferred to people mm -hmm. that actually are not structured properly mm -hmm. in such a way that you end up incurring transfer duty. So mm -hmm. if you add up all those uh, deathbed expenses as a result of poor estate duty tax planning, you might em end up sitting with about 42% of your wealth mm -hmm. actually going to... Um, Going, going over to SARS instead of retaining it mm. from generations to uh, preserving mm. it actually for generation to generation. So you want to make sure that you actually plan it in such a way that you preserve most of your wealth that you can actually pre make sure that your kids are mm. well taken upon your death, uh, your, f your surviving spouse is well taken care of, and on top of that you don't pay unnecessary mm. tax. You also at the end of the day try to balance the tax planning financing efficiency and asset protection. So I'm gonna mm. hand over to Bruno to say, okay, after you structured your investment structure okay. in such a way that a tax planning has been contained in a more optimized level without compromising the asset protection, mm. how do you then ensure that all your investment structures are, are attractive mm. to the banks because you also want to grow and create wealth mm. uh, uh, for, your, for your generation from gener one generation to the next Absolutely. generation. So, so Bruno, please take Excellent. them through the financing Excellent. efficiency. Thanks so much. So um, uh, it, it's pretty much a given now where the financing efficiency came in. We, we spoke about the other principles and what the impact is. So the converse applies. If a person focuses too much on financing efficiency, you might land up putting all your eggs in one basket. Uh, potentially, that's a great thing. There's a lot of income in that company and the banks love it. Uh, but obviously it does expose you because if one thing goes wrong in that company, it impacts you and it might actually even reduce your ability to obtain finance. Mm -hmm. um, so from a financing efficiency or, or, or financing optimization perspective, we work with professionals that help with this. Um, but it is, you know, certain rules to bear in mind, for example, is the fact that if you take out a loan in your own personal name, um, your affordability is impacted, meaning that the next time you want to buy a property and lands up being in your own personal name or even through a company and they look at your affordability so that you can sign a surety ship, you may not be able to get that property because your affordability, even to sign a surety ship agreement on behalf of a company, still needs to look good. So that one property in your personal name can actually cause a lot of trouble for you um, it, with respect to affordability. So ideally, you'd want to avoid having anything in your own personal name. Uh, a surety ship agreement is generally what is required in order for um, in order to buy a property in a company name. So just bear that in mind. Uh, there is there is a level after a few years when the company starts running successfully, it does get to a point where the banks are willing to consider the company's own affordability mm -hmm. without having to look at yours. And that is the goal, mm -hmm. because you'd want to be able to achieve that, get this company running by itself and move on and potentially start a new company after that and start again from the beginning. So that's where you want to aim um, like this. When you pass a certain age and the banks aren't willing to give you long term loans anymore, you've got companies that can take it out relatively easily mm -hmm. without you having to convince the bank uh, without you having to to really try and apply to to the bank and get very short-term 10 to 15 year loans um, so sorry yeah, I know no, I just wanted to add to, to, to that that uh, also the trust um, uh, what do you call it? the trust setting up mm. they need to ensure that at least they've got three uh, minimum trustees to yeah be absolutely able to be attractive for absolutely financing so other so little tricks something that you've other done. little tricks um, where it comes t to uh, considering the the National Credit Act and whether you fall within the ambit of the act and how the banks will consider your loans so if you do your structuring properly you could actually avoid um, all the stringent requirements that come with falling within the ambit of the National Credit Act, meaning that you could potentially apply for more loans or higher loans. Um, so just to wrap up, and the point of this is, there are professionals out there that can help you with this. It is a very one-on-one -on -one consultation where we need to truly understand what your needs are in order to be able to take these principles and apply them to you. Um, but use your, your, uh, use your wealth professional to your advantage, because if you don't now, unfortunately later, 
uh, you will land up having to pay for it. Um, and rather do it now when you can still control it versus later when unfortunately your property's increased in value and moving it really becomes yes. difficult or you pass away and your estate lands up paying 42% in tax. Yes. Uh, but more importantly, don't procrastinate and don't be scared of an investment. This is not overly complex. This is things that we do on a daily basis. It's yeah. just a matter of you wrapping your mind around the need for it. But once you do, you're good. You're mm -hmm. good to go and you're, you're well off on your property journey. So good luck and I hope this, this was helpful. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, thank you so much. We're looking forward to see you. Thank Thanks, you. Guys.